I've been surrounded by mountains my entire life. Whichever way you look, the Fraser Valley is surrounded by rolling hills and rugged mountain peaks. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I fully realized the complete vastness of the place I thought I knew. The valley is a vast wilderness filled with countless streams, rivers, and mountain peaks. This underdeveloped tangent off the Fraser Valley is home to hundreds of species, unique ecosystems and landforms, holds significant historical narratives to the settlement of the lower mainland of British Columbia, and boasts ecotourism potential from the valley floor to the highest peaks. I'm on a mission to learn more about this beautiful, wild place so many of us call home, and how we can protect it for years to come. The Chilliwack River Valley. The geology of British Columbia in general is incredibly complex compared to the rest of Canada. It's, uh, uh, British Columbia, most of it is, is uh, composed of exotic pieces of crust that have been rafted in on tectonic plates and then accreted to the western edge of the continent. So much of the rock that forms the Cascade Ranges were formed in the South Pacific somewhere hundreds of millions of years ago. So if you look at the Cascade Ranges, they're made up of a lot of that exotic rock that's been formed in faraway places. And it, when it collided and was scraped out, it was deformed as well, and we call it metamorphosis. And, and Mount Shem is, is granitic rock, which was formed at depth in the crust and lifted up uh, due to tectonic processes with a bunch of exotic uh, accreted material formed in the South Pacific, it's, you know, attached to the side of it. So, so if you hike around in there, it's very complex. You can, you know, stand on Chem and look 20 kilometers to the southwest and see Mount Maguire, which is entirely made up of limestone. It's just a completely different kind of mountain. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of contrast between these these peaks down there and what they're made up and up of, and it helps us understand how the you know the continents form globally. Um, and that's sort of characteristic of of most of the Cascade Range is made up of these bits and pieces of exotic stuff. So it's very complicated geologically, which makes it very interesting. And the other thing about Chem is because it's so very high, over 2,000 meters high, it actually extended above the, uh, the ice sheet during the last ice age. So about 20, 22,000 years ago, ice advanced into the Fraser Valley. The climate was very cold mm -hmm. and it got thicker and thicker. And most of the mountains were cut completely covered by ice, like the ones we know the best, like Mount Seymour on the North Shore and Grouse Mountain where the ski hills are. And mountains like that were completely covered by ice, so they're nice and rounded and rounded on the top. Whereas Mount Chem was tall enough to stick up over the ice, um, so the top is very pointed and very rugged as a result. So mountains like Mount Chem were used for us to gauge the thickness of the last ice sheet. So it's regionally it's very important as a sort of a meter stick for measuring the thickness of the ice sheet. For, for the the Chem ranges in that, for it's important in understanding how the continent was assembled. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the big jigsaw puzzle of of what's ninety percent of British Columbia is is the attachment of these exotic pieces of crust. Um, so knowing how it fits into the puzzle is really important as part of the puzzle. Without knowing all the pieces, you just have a glimpse of the history of the province. Is there a unique biology to the Chilliwack River Valley? There is unique um, a habitat there that supports a very productive fishery uh, for salmon, for example, uh, cutthroat trout, other species. There is uh, some threatened uh, and endangered species that are in the, in the river valley. The uh, coastal giant salamander is an example of that. Um, there's uh, uh, some interesting habitat as you go up elevation, uh, for example, at the top of the Chilliwack River Road uh, there at the, at the near Chilliwack Lake, you enter into a more sandy substrate that supports lodgepole pine. And it's a, it's a community that's that it's the only lodgepole pine community west of the Cascade Mountains, uh, Coast Mountains. Usually it's a, it's a landscape you find more towards the interior. Uh, but up there with the well-drained soils, uh, it, it hosts this other habitat there. Uh, adds a lot of biodiversity to, to the river area, mm -hmm. to that watershed. In general, I'd say the biggest uh, human sort of impact to the area would be logging and resource extraction. 
All the sediment and the water, everything eventually is going down to the Chilliwack River. All of the slopes uh, and the sediment that they carry and mm -hmm. you know the disturbance on the land. If we clear cut, then that means more rain uh, directly hits the ground and therefore you've got more soil erosion in the area. Uh, more clear cuts could lead to more landslides or more, more impact on the roads that currently exist, for example, washouts and things like that. Chilliwack River Valley is, uh, is very much a multi-use landscape. Mm -hmm. It has lots of ecotourism from kayaking on the river to hiking. There is an enormous amount of ecotourism potential uh, for, there's the salmon fishing, but also the cutthroat trout uh, runs at different times, so it's a, it's a year-round fishery, really. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, swimming holes, and so to think that we're not going to go up there and use it is ridiculous. Uh, there's a lot of money invested in resource extraction up there, and so although I would like to see gravel extraction stop, uh, or at least managed more than it is, I guess, the uh, trying to stop that and no longer allow that, especially and logging as well, uh, it's probably going to be very challenging to stop that. So then you get into the idea of, well, how do we manage it? How do we sustainably manage the landscape? Uh, and some of that would be to promote ecotourism because that means there's dollar value associated with getting people up there to experience wilderness. And that will become more and more important. And I think it's something that the, uh, the Fraser Valley should do more of. Chillock River Valley is one of, my, one of my favorite places in the world. I think it's a really cool part of the, of the world. It's sort of a forgotten forgotten tangent off of the Fraser Valley and it's so close to Metro Vancouver and yet people don't really know about it. It still feels wild, it still feels remote and uh, and so I spend a lot of my private time there but it's also our main place for, for guiding. It's one of the main places we take clients on, on our trips. So we have some really experienced uh, clients depending on, on some of our trips but we also have a lot of first time uh, people, a lot of people who have perhaps lived in Chilliwack their whole lives and never spent much time in our backcountry. Um, or there's people from all over the Lower Mainland or, or people from out of country and, and traveling through this part of the world and um, they want to check out the mountains. So it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity to have somebody from Europe who has their perspective on what it's like guiding in the Alps and they see, um, they see wild places that hasn't existed in, in Europe for, for centuries and, and yet you pair that with somebody from Vancouver who takes this for granted and it's an interesting conversation that happens, uh, happens on the trail. Shyam is our cardinal hike. It's the one that uh, we take clients to the most because it's the most significant peak in our in our area. Uh, the relief from the Fraser Valley to the summit of of Shyam over 2,000 meters of vertical fall. It's uh, it's fantastic and and people have an emotional connection to it. My favorite is when we guide our local residents from Chilliwack who've lived here for 20, 30 years and hiking up the south side. You don't have a view over the Fraser Valley until you just get to the very summit and then you watch people's faces light up and they just look at their part of the world differently for the first time and um, it's, a, it's a really cool experience. Sham's very special and our First Nations have known that for a long time and I think our generation of residency in, in the Chilliwack area is finally coming to realize how just how important the mountains are and, and starting to reflect some of those historical values that I think the First Nations um, have been trying to teach us for a long time. I think it would be naive to believe that we would just leave all lands untouched otherwise. And people have habitated here for a long time. People are going to play and recreate. But industry also has a role to play. So are we going to extract gravel? Are we going to log? Are we going to mine? What are, what are we going to use the land base for as, as people in this area? And so how do we prioritize it? And so I think when we start to look at guiding and we focus on how do we make this place um, economically viable. I think tourism is, a, is it easy, um, an easy sell and I think it does preserve the land base in the best way. We can, we can do that poorly or we can do it very well and I, I'm, my focus is to, to work towards how do we make it sustainable, how do we show people this place and yet show them how to respect it and, uh, and not have a huge impact. On our way out to some of our guided trips we might drive by a cut block, um, we might drive by uh, somebody who's left garbage on the side of the road or an unkept campsite, those sorts of things and um, and so it's a it's a shame when we have to um, when we have to educate our clients on that stuff but it's also an opportunity to say 
this is the way to use this resource. You can you can drive or walk sustainably in this place and, and enjoy it and leave it better than you left it. And so for me when I guide, that's a huge focus. And for my guides as well, when we're in the backcountry, we're the best stewards of the land. Um, we're both showing people how to do it, but we're also cleaning up other people's garbage. We're, we're working towards those sorts of things as we, uh, um, as we guide a trip. There's a lot of people who go out and some of these places feel very, very vast. They feel really wild and untouched. And until you spend time there and you realize that a mark that you leave, you will see in a week when you come back. Um, I think it's an education piece that needs to go along with that passion. But I think until, um, until we get people outside, until we have our generation enjoying the outdoors, um, you know, there's that sentiment that says, you will not fight to save what you do not love and you don't love what you don't know. And so until we know the backcountry, until we spend time there and in the wild places, we're not going to love it, we're not going to preserve it. There's different levels of protection afforded to certain areas in the Chilock River Valley. So we have um, some protected watersheds. Uh, we've got some protected kind of old growth management areas. So there's perhaps some harvesting allowed, but not full clear cutting allowed in certain drainages and basins. Um, there's certain plant species or mountain goat habitat that's protected, alpine. Um, there's other pieces that are protected for aesthetics. Uh, so above certain elevations, um, logging is not, not allowed because it would look like a giant scar on the mountainside and it would take too long for it to regenerate. So there are certain levels of protection that are afforded, but with Cultus Lake on the west side of the valley um, and leading into the Umption Ecological Re Reserve, and then at the east end of the valley, there's Chilock Lake Provincial Park. Um, I, I think that there is a, a case to be made to protect the entire valley, and I'm not naive to what that would mean. But when you take a look on a, on a more global perspective, um, Mount Baker National Forest and, and that whole wildlife preserve that happens south of the border, it's some of the most treasured lands in um, Washington State because of how unique and how beautiful it is. Um, the uniqueness and the and the significance of that backcountry doesn't stop at the international border. It carries right through into the Chilliwack River Valley, and I would argue, from the Skagit Valley to Hope to Chilliwack. Trans border uh, trans border landscape management is mm -hmm. always an issue. So. Obviously, we need to think about wildlife corridors and other things, and we have, we have to look beyond the 49th parallel, essentially, if we're going to manage cross-border populations of, of species. <laughs> Monitoring species here and thinking about how species to the south travel to the north and get into the northernmost part of their range is, is I think, pretty critical to making sure that these species don't have further contraction uh, in their distribution. This section of, of mountains is, is pretty unique and, and uh, harbors um, very unique habitat for, for certain animals as well and, and plant species and I think that Canada could take a more progressive stance and, and protect some of these areas, whether that's a provincial park or just a, uh, some sort of reserve land, a regional park, something like that. We've got a cool part of the world that we need to, uh, to be forward-looking enough to preserve it for generations to come. The Cascade Range and the Chilliwack River Valley is home to the rugged mountains and the meandering river. Each part of the river valley, from its forested wetlands to its alpine meadows, each interacts with one another and creates a unique ecosystem for many plants and animals. However, these areas are constantly being impacted through human activities, both positively and negatively. In order to keep our river valley sustained, we must shift to more resilient and sustainable practices and give protection where protection is due. It's up to us, the people who know it and the people who love it.